Uh, when my brothers and I were growing up, you know, there were no books, or very few books at all about jazz. And so I was the one that always would copy the Miles Davis Quintet or the uh, Horace Silver Quintet or the Benny Golson. I would copy the parts off the record so we could play them and, and replicate them as kids. And so I always had the ear for that. And it was always fun to write the stuff down then hear it played back like I did that, even though it was someone else's stuff. So I've always had that, that penchant for uh, writing. And when I got on the road, I mean, I went through you know, college and learned uh, some arranging. But when I got on Buddy Rich's band, that's when I really felt the power of what an arrangement can do. Because, you know, those, those arrangements were so important to the success of that band. So, um, little by little, it just evolved that I started writing more than I was practicing. And, it, and then, uh, back then, and that's true today with your generation, but you weren't believable as doing two things. You know, like Bobby Brookmeyer, Jerry Mulligan, Al Cohn, they were never taken seriously as writers because they could play, they were players. So they also wrote. So in the city, they didn't, they didn't trust anybody or give you the, the, uh, the anointment of being a composer unless that's all you did. So. I gravitated toward the writing and made the decision in 1969. I quit the road, and even though it was a cushion, nice money coming in, I said, I'm going to do it, whatever it takes. So I quit the road and uh, just started writing. And I was sending arrangements to this one and that one. And then Buddy got the, uh, the contract with RCA Victor. And there was a big cattle call in Philadelphia where he was playing a week's gig. And all of us, Don Sebesky, me, Bob James, everybody came in to Philadelphia with their charts. And so he picked mine. So that was put me on the map. And I think it was the first time in college when I put a, an arrangement in front of a band to hear that played back to you. It was just an amazing sound experience. I think that's that's where it started. But, but I actually made the conscious decision about 1969. You know, the reason I write the way I write is because of years of absorbing music by listening not through a couple of earbuds but so I'm walking down the steps, but sitting down and actually listening and absorbing music because we were listening constantly because television was minimal and there's no video games, there were no computers, as you know, no distractions. So that's one thing they can't get anywhere else except doing it themselves. Now I found when the kids get to college, they start discovering the breadth of our jazz music and, and some really take it seriously and start listening backwards from what they know now. The other thing that they can't get from the internet, that they can get from an individual, is editing. Okay, I can't teach composition, but I can I can look at a composition and show a student where this could be edited and the statement could be just as strong. Or I can give the student uh, uh, certain challenges like the, the advanced comp class, different ways of of coming up with ideas and harmonic structures. So uh, in a more focused way, if you can find it on the internet, but it's random. You can't get specific. So those are two things. But I tell you, uh, the best thing that could happen to any student is to have a listening background. But again, uh, there's not as, a, as much time on their hands today that they have to go listen. I, I don't teach private arranging lessons. I never have in the 23 years I've been here because they can't hear it played immediately. The only way to learn uh, is to hear it played. So as you said, you take an arranging class or take an arranging lesson with me and then the next the next day you can hear the big band play it. Or you do the film scoring class and our, our symphony orchestra plays your film score. There's no better experience than that. I can sit down and point things out in a score. This is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. I can do that for three weeks, but one standing in front of an ensemble, you hear it immediately. You know, Mancini always said to me, he said, I always get scared when I get on the podium. No matter how many years I've been doing this, I stand up there and I'm scared. And then I hear it played back and I realize, yes, I was right, but I could have done this better, I could have done this better. So there's no better uh, opportunity. So I put Quietude by Thad Jones in the computer and played it back. And, and I also put Gil Evans' My Ship into Finale and played it back with the best sounds and it sucks mm -hmm. but when you hear it played live you hear that those beautiful colors uh, on my new recording uh, you remember the chart I did on Atlantis mm -hmm. and there's a middle section that was very dense and very strange harmonies well if you hear that on the computer you'd never put in front of a musician you say oh that I'd be so embarrassed but you have to know that it works and it works mm -hmm.
Well, what I hope our curriculum, you know, in, encourages and enforces is for our students to be so well-rounded today when they get out these four doors or four walls or whatever it is we got here. Um, unlike when I came up, today you have to be, as you know, you have to be your own booking agent. You have to be your own arranger, composer, your own manager, your own video editor for your electronic press kit, your audio, you know, all your audio engineer. You have to do all of that. So that's why we've implemented the courses we have with the video editing and the audio editing as part of this, the degree program. And the music business classes, the two music business classes, which are my, the favorite of mine, because I love to see students understand the business all of a sudden and see how they can get a revenue stream happening right away and also protect their music. You know, there's a lot of predators out there. There's a lot of non-creative people who prey on creative people. It's been happening for a gazillion years. So. Uh, this this is something that I'm, I'm really uh, you know, adamant about that the students learn the copyright law, learn publishing, learn learn all the rules and regulations that they can to protect themselves and also give themselves a good business savvy to you know have a career. You know, you've got it. You've got to handle it all yourself, and then also know when to get legal advice and when you really need to have this contract or that contract. So I think we do that well here. The, the obvious advantage to anyone who's actually gone through the program is the fact that we're a smaller program. You get one, a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, instruction. No, no TAs all the time teaching your classes. You get the, the real deal. And um, you, you have a, a, a more flexibility in your scheduling here. I think, it, and you know, for a small city, this is, there's more gigs here in, in, in town than there, there are in New York City per capita, uh, for, for real. Uh, but I think the main thing is the smaller class size, the more individual attention you get, and quite frankly, an extremely non-competitive student body, where they're not trying to cut your throat every five seconds. They're, everyone encourages everybody to play. And also I think the other advantage is that we have all these diverse combos and, and, and ensembles that students play in, so you don't just get stuck in a bop setting when they stay there. You know, they can do the Brazilian ensemble, the contemporary ensemble, so I think that's one of the advantages we have as well as the other things I said.